Many of you already know through our prairie lines and stuff that Crystal Dutton was in an automobile accident this uh, last weekend. We bruised and beat up pretty good, so uh, having a little hard time breathing with the bruised ribs. So uh, these guys come in to stand in for her and to stand up for her, amen, and uh, appreciate you continuing to pray for her as well. You've already been asking me, where's Miss Kathy this morning? She went off to a uh, birthday party for her great aunt of a reached 100 years of age. So uh, praise the Lord. I figure that's a milestone. And I'm not big on birthday parties, so you got me. <laughs> but it's good to see you. We're continuing with messages that we started last week called The Miracle in the Making. And obvious is if you were here last week, you know the direction of this whole series. And it's really just two-part uh, series. Uh, it has to do with stewardship and the faithfulness of how that we can be stewards for Christ and how that we can be faithful givers in Christ because of the miracle that God's continually performing in our life. And we saw through Exodus last week how the Lord performed a miracle in the midst of the camp of Israel so as to provide for the tabernacle. Let me just uh, reiterate why, why I don't preach what I'm preaching again this week. Uh, I'm not preaching this because the church needs your money. So take a breath. I know that flows against the tide of what's popular opinions in most people's mind and in church, but God meets our needs. Hallelujah. And God does it supernaturally. And if God chooses to use you, I'll praise the Lord. We won't give you a golden ribbon or anything. You just rejoice in Jesus that you got to be used by God. There's no higher privilege than that to start with. I'm not preaching this message either uh, because we're trying to build a Christian theme park. <laughs> I know, that's sad, isn't it? Some of y'all want a Christian theme park. Uh, nor am I preaching it because I need a $54 million jet. So uh, you can rest on that one. Uh, as Paul said, I have not withheld preaching the whole truth to you. Uh, it's our responsibility as ministers of the gospel to preach the whole Bible. All right? Uh, also, another reason I'm preaching, not only is it my responsibility to preach all the, the Bible and all that the Bible has to say, but it's my responsibility as a minister of God to be faithful in teaching you and not steering away from any part of truth in Scripture, uh, no matter if it's an exciting part or part that might not be so exciting for some others. We're here to preach the Word of God. Paul also made the statement that I do preach these things so that you might be fruitful. So I don't say my own purposes or that I might be fruitful, that I might gain from you. He said, but I'm preaching and teaching these things that you can be fruitful in your life. You can experience the blessings of God in your life. Ultimately, the need is for us to glorify God in all things. And so I don't know where you are in this whole thing about giving and generosity and financing and supporting the, the work of the kingdom of God, but I pray today you'll listen with a very open heart because I believe, one, if you are already doing these things, then it's certainly going to serve as encouragement and reminder of just how worshipful this is when we come to the point of giving in our life. But two, maybe you've slacked off and you just haven't been faithful in, in doing what God's called you to do. I encourage you to listen carefully. This will be an encouragement to you. Get back on track and see what God can do in your life. These are some of the most exciting principles of Scripture that you will ever learn. You know, I think it's important we learn these truths. I was preaching these truths in Bulgaria. Now, remember Bulgaria, like Belize, it's a third world country. And when the communists left there, and like, as in most in Eastern Europe, they just robbed them blind and took everything. And uh, so I'm preaching... There's probably about a thousand people. The crowd was so big we had to put them in two different rooms. Uh, the thousand pastors and another, their wives and some of their staffs, so we probably had about 2,500 people in there in, present in these two rooms, and so we're doing a closed circuit to the other room. And I'm there with several other people in ministry. Of course, Dr. Nicole is there and serving as a translator. Then there were two other seminary professors and, a, and, a, and another pastor of a church, a, a church is near here, a doctor so-and-so. We'll just leave it at that. And... Uh, I'm preaching these messages, and he came up quite surprised and thought, well, why are you preaching this in a third world country? And I said, well, just need to listen to the whole series and see what you think about it. And so he came to each series, uh, each, each of the four messages that I preached on, on, on faithfulness and, and giving and stewardship, and listened very carefully. I've not only preached that, by the way, in, there I preached it in Mexico, I preached it in Belize and other third world countries, because if anybody needs to hear it, third world countries need to hear this. Because the key to receiving and having your needs met is always found in giving and learning the biblical principles of faith. But it was interesting that as I, as I concluded this series, he took me aside and he says, you know, he said, I have been preaching at such and such church north of us, large church in the middle of the woods, a very prosperous area. He said he'd since retired from there, but he said, you know, I, I preached there 20-something years. He said, and I never once, not once, did I preach on giving or finances. He said, I, we were a very prosperous church. We had a lot of wealthy people. They were pretty much good givers. He said, our needs were always met. 
And uh, so I try to remind him, I, I don't preach it to get the offerings up, all right? I preach it so people can have freedom in their lives and victory in their lives. And he says, you know, he said, I really sat and listened to these sermons with, with a great deal of interest. He said, and I'm, I'm very regretful at this point right now. He said, I think I really did a disservice to my congregation by not teaching him these biblical principles. And uh, which was better than some of that I expected to hear, <laughs> maybe coming back. But it was interesting to note that, you know, it's not, about, it's not about whether we have money coming in or not coming in, and that's not the reason we preach these things. I, I preach on stewardship as part of my regular preaching schedule because I think it's important we're reminded of these things. As I said last week, they were reminded we need to be soul winners. They were reminded we need to be in the Word of God. We're re being reminded that we need to be prayerful. We, we're being reminded that we're, you know, we need to be intercessors. So this is just part of, the, it's part of the package of the Word of God. Amen? These things are all inclusive. So there is something here that will help you in your spiritual walk in life. It's not about getting something. And if it were not for someone sitting down, my brother's sitting on the front row today. And I remember when, as young preachers, we were both single, living together, that a Manly Beasley, an evangelist at the time, was in a conference at the church we were at. And after the conference, Phil and I sat down with him, and he sat down and he, he wrote out some things, said, if you'll learn these principles, guys, and he was just young, long-haired preachers getting involved in ministry, he says, you, you never suffer in your ministry in, 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 in regards. If you can keep these things and live by these faith principles. And he sat down and began to teach us those principles of what it was. And just about four or five things, but God is the source of all things. We've talked about that in the past. We'll talk a little bit more about today. And that God you know, is God's will to meet your needs. That a Christian who's not having their needs met, that's, an, that, that's, that's not within the common flow of God's work in our lives. It's, it's God's will to, to meet our needs. It's, we're, we're in his family. He's our, our fathers. Every loving father wants to meet the needs. And the only reason our needs are not being met what he stated was because there's probably some other area of equal importance in your life that God's trying to develop in your life. And he talked to us about how God's the source and how that we, if we're going to receive what we need, then we need to learn how to be givers because the secret is, is not in the getting, the secret's in the giving. Scripture makes it clear that, you know, it's more blessed to, to give than it is to receive. And I'll mention that a little bit in a moment. Now, the miracles, we talk about the miracle in the making in this, this sermon series, as we talked about last week in Exodus. Remember, we talked about how that the children of Israel, they've left Egypt, they've been in bondage for 200 years. They're on their way to the promised land, and God says, all right, it's time. We're going to, I want you to build this, this tent of fellowship, this tent of meeting, and, it, and it's an elaborate ordeal that he takes them through. In fact, there's this long, elaborated description of the tabernacle. There's more detail given to the description of the tabernacle than there is heaven, and more detail about the tabernacle than there is the temple. There's more detail about, about anything that's built, the ark, whatever. The detail is incredible. He's telling him every aspect of, the, of this tent and this enormous tabernacle of meeting, and where there's got to be an outer court, an inner court, the place of the holy place, the holy of holies, how every part's constructed. He gives them the list of the materials to make it with. It's going to require gold and silver and unique materials and leather and porpoise skin. All kinds of stuff is involved in, in this detailed description of this tent of meeting. Now, and he tells them, I'm going to have the people bring an offering to meet this particular need. And then we read the story, if you remember, that he's talking to people who've been in bondage and slaves for 200 years. They don't have a dime to their name, all right, in the normal set of things. But the miracle was that God gave them what would be needed while they were still in Egypt. We were referred back to Exodus when God told the children of Israel to go door to door to their Egyptian neighbors and ask them for gold, silver, brass, precious materials, and didn't say bar it. I think King James says bar, but they didn't say bar because, you know, it's not what it was about. He said, just ask them for it. And it says, and that God gave favor to the children of Israel, all right? By, by moving in the hearts of the Egyptians so they wanted to give them something. It reminds me of the passage when God says, you give, you know, and, 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 and we give it unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give back into your bosom. So God creates this deal in the men's heart of lost pagan Egyptians to load up the children of Israel with all kinds of wealth. I mean, they had to carry it out in carts when they left. And it says this in Exodus, and so... So the children of Israel plundered Egypt. Wasn't a knife raised, wasn't a, a shot fired, wasn't a, of course they had guns, but there wasn't any sword swung. God just did it, a supernatural thing. And now they're loaded down with all this wealth as they leave, 
And God tells them while they're in the, in the wilderness, by the way, I want you to bring an offering for the tent of meeting. I want you to bring an offering. Well, they couldn't go reach in the pocket. Well, he's just poor slaves. We ain't got nothing. God had blessed them and prepared in them already. And it's the same today. God doesn't work any differently than that. You understand that, right? That God's given you what you need to give already. Amen. A lot of people say, well, you know, if I just had more to give, then I would give. No, God's given you to give out of what you've been given. And if you get faithful in that, then God says he, he'll, he'll, he'll even do more within your life. But the idea is not in the getting, remember? The secret's in the? The what? Uh, that's like a cuss word for some of y'all. Remember Fonz couldn't say sorry. You know, I was so sorry. Some people like, give. So <laughs> it's in the what? The giving. So we learn to be generous people as the children of God. For God so loved, he, he gave. God's a giver. We're never more like God than when we're giving, I think. Amen? That and soul winning, that's when we're most like Jesus, I believe, and the most like God. So God is dealing with people. Now, I kind of referred to that last week as the Moses method. All right? So today, part two, we'll, let's just call this the David method. And remember, David now is on down the road here. It's time to build the temple. God doesn't want David to build the temple. Solomon's going to build the temple. But it is in the heart of David to provide everything to Solomon for the building of the temple. And in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, if you'll open your Bible, we're going to read from a passage there, all right? And you're going to see the same thing kind of reiterated in this passage that David, as he speaks to the Lord and speaks to the congregation of Israel, to get to the place of preparing this great place of worship and fellowship and ministry, that, that how, how God works there in, in very unique but similar ways, all right? So God's basically saying, what, what I'm required you to do, I've given you to do. So let's stand as we honor the reading of the Word in 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and in verse 10. As we start there, it says this, So David blessed the Lord in the sight of all the assembly, and David said, Blessed art thou, Lord, O Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and forever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in heaven and earth, thine is the dominion, O Lord, and thou dost exalt thyself as head over all, both riches and and honor come from thee. And thou dost rule over all, and in thy hand is the power and might, and in it lies in thy hand to make great and to strengthen every one. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. But who am I, and who are my people that should be able to offer as generously as this? For all things come from thee, and from thy hand we have given thee. For we are sojourners before thee, and tenants all, as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no hope. O oh Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided to build thee a house for thy holy name, it is from thy hand, and all is thine. Somebody say amen to the reading of the word. You may be seated. Setting of this, obviously, is David, and it's really a, a celebration of offerings for the construction of the actual temple that's going to be constructed for the glory and the presence of God amongst his people. David, in this passage, if you read the earlier parts of it, you can go back and read it later, he's making it very clear to the people that he is giving an offering himself. And he's asking them what they're going to do. Now, he, without any hesitation, if you go back and look up around 5, 6, 7, 8, you'll see that he says, here's what I'm giving. Here's what I've given. And here, here he just lays it out and he makes a list of what he's given and what he's been collecting for obviously for some time from the cedar and the, the timbers and even the stone that would be used and the different colors of stone and the gold and the brass and all the different things for the vessels and the furnishings of the temple. He said, here it all is. This is what I've done. And he's just celebrating with them. Some people might think, well, that's a little bit arrogant. No, I think it's not arrogant. I think it's leadership. I think he's in challenging them. I, I, I don't expect anybody in our church to give if I'm not given. In fact, it's been in my heart and Kathy's heart a long time that we always want to be, it's our passion and desire to always be the biggest givers in the church. Now, I may not give more money than you because you might make a lot more money than I do, but I want the percentage of what I give to be the largest of anybody's percentages in the fellowship. But I think that's what gets back to leadership in our lives. Amen? So if I'm asking you to read your Bible, I better be reading my Bible. If I'm asking you to tell people about Jesus, I need to be telling people about Jesus. If I'm asking you to pray, then I need to be leading the way in prayer. That's just the simple principles of what real leadership involves in our lives. 
But it's interesting as David goes through this, he says, here's what I've given. Now, what are you going to do, and how are you going to function this? And, and you can see how the people responded to his challenge when he, it says uh, in verse 6, Then the family leaders and the leaders of the tribes of Israel, the generals and the captains of the army and the king's administrative offices, they all gave willingly. He says, I'm giving. And they said, we're giving too. Folks, I believe in what we're doing here. That's why I give. I believe in what God's will and purposes are through our fellowship. That's why I give. But more than that, I give because I love God. You give because you love God. You give because you understand on some level that as we give, God is glorified. Lives are changed. Eternal things are happening all around us as we continue to be obedient to the Lord. So he's laying out before them. Here's what I want you to do. But as you read his prayer and as his dedication a while ago, you just see about it. If you walk through it, there is an exuberance. There's a joy. There's an excitement about the giving that's taking place there. And he says, Lord, we give this willingly. Remember last week and the, the Moses method and the offering? They kept giving so much to this project the Lord had called them to, the tent of fellowship, the tabernacle, and they kept bringing it. They were excited. God was in their midst. God was moving. They were going to have a place to visibly fellowship in the presence of God. It was just an exciting time. And so everybody's just bringing stuff, and they keep bringing stuff. You need anything today? Let me get it. I'll bring it. And it says they all gave willingly, and over and over, I mean, probably four or five times in that passage in Exodus, it kept dealing with their willing heart, the willingness, the joyfulness, and the gladness that they brought it with. And remember, finally it got to the point that the Moses had to stand up and say, okay, that's enough. The Lord said, we got everything we need for this project. Just stop your giving. Well, that's the dream of most every pastor I know. <laughs> Amen. You just, but there was such an excitement, and I really believe that today and in the church, not just, and I, can, I believe, I can sense it here at times, people just lose the joy of that. All right? They just lose the excitement about realization, that, that, that understanding that, hey, they're, they're part of something far bigger than themselves. And I think that's what the children of Israel caught when they were in bondage and Moses steps on the scene and they begin to be reminded of the promises of Abraham and they begin to see God's involvement. They begin to see the plagues. They begin to see God's commitment to them to liberate them. And all of a sudden they're kind of saying, oh, well, maybe we really are a, 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 a blessed people. Maybe we really are. Maybe God really is going to do something with us. Folks, I think it's time we woke up. Yes, we really are a blessed people. And yes, God is doing something with us. But how much more will he do when our hearts are willingly participating and cooperating in his plan and the way he desires to do things? There is an excitement. There should be an enthusiasm. And you see it here in the people. And they it says they gave willingly. Then I remind you of 2 Corinthians when Paul's talking to the church. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly, he reaps sparingly. And he who sows bountifully, well, he also reaps bountifully. Now catch this. Let each one, just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly, not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So well, you're giving, not because somebody's twisting your arm. You're giving not because you just see the need. And I think a lot of times that, that that's what happens. You know, we want to give to the children's home, so we show the little children, you know, and, and we want to give to the feeding fund. And so we show, now I'm not putting down people that do it, but I think that should not be what motivates us. It's nice to see where it's going, but what motivates us is the spirit of the living God who's working in us, and we begin to have the vision that we really are part of something much bigger than ourselves. The kingdom of God and the glory of God. And this is all David's prayer. It keeps pointing to these things. He says, this is what it means. We're a part of something of the glory of God that's involved. And who are we that we get to be a part of it is what David says. And Paul's writing to the church, and he's telling the same thing in, in 2 Corinthians, that, hey, you're part of something. You're co-laborers with God. You're working in God's kingdom. You're part of God's family. You're in God's vineyard. You're serving with God for the glory of God, and God's going to do something with your life and through your life. But you need to participate in it. And what did he say there? He said, hey, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, in 2 Chronicles 29, one thing you'll see about it is you go through the passage that it is certainly marked with enthusiasm, with excitement. There's a joyfulness. There's a cheerfulness there. There's an excitement that God loves a cheerful giver. You've heard me say this before from, from, from the Scriptures. In the original language of the Greek, that word is hilaros, and that's the way we would spell it here, H-L-A-R-O-S, in our, in, in, our trans, in our transliteration of it. But it is the word 
that we get our English word hilarious from. When's the last time you just got hilarious? All right? With, with joy about something. You were just overwhelmed with excitement about something. It might have been your firstborn child. It might have been your first grandbaby. I don't know, but you were just thrilled and you were excited and, and you, were, you were overwhelmed with the, with the joy of the moment. You know, I, start, I looked up in the, the thesaurus because I, I use my thesaurus a lot. <laughs> but I was looking at this particular word just in the English language when he said that God loves this cheerful giver. And, and here's some words it uses in, 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 in translating this word for us and helping us understand it, the synonyms. It means God loves a happy giver, a cheery giver. Anybody cheery today? Amen. A jolly. Anybody jolly about their offering today? Yes. Smiling, joyful, merry, my favorite, jovial. Oh. <laughs> Let's give a jovial offering. Hey, I'm sure this is one of your favorites. Sunny yes. or chirpy. I haven't seen anybody chirping around the offering receptacle lately. <laughs> Jaunty, gleeful, optimistic, positive, lively, in good spirits. And then it listed an antonym, the opposite. And this, is, this, this one simple three-letter word for the antonym is pretty much kind of pinpoints where most folks are. Sad. Sad to see it go. <laughs> Sad to let go of it. Sad you were reminded. Sad, 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 sad. It doesn't have to be sad. Scripture, when it talks about the kind of giving that we are a part of for the glory of God, is anything but sad. It is joyful and it is exciting and it is hilarious if we really, truly understand it. I think the greatest example, I'll use Phil because he's here, when we were sitting around after we learned that lesson, and we were, you know, we were single guys uh, meeting in a home that he'd established for outreach on the weekends, and I'd moved in with him, and was working with him in, in, in that outreach, and, you know, uh, you talk about limited income, you know, we weren't making really any money except buy groceries and eat. That's why to this day, after a couple of years working there, to this day, I will not eat Jack in the Box tacos. <laughs> I don't know, do you still eat Jack in the Box tacos? I don't know. I don't. Because for about 18 months to two years, the learning these principles, it was Jack in the Box tacos almost every day for one of the meals. Sorry. 99 cents and you're in and out. Praise the Lord. Thank God for Jack in the Box back in those days. Amen. That's your only commercial, Jack in the Box. But, you know... After, you know, Brother Beasley sat down and taught us these things, I mean, the first thing we did, I kind of looked at Phil and said, we ain't got nothing to give. And so we went back to the house, and we started just giving extra shoes away or a shirt away or clothes. We gathered up anything in the house we could give away and just found somebody to give it to, you know, and just, just we're happy about it and excited. Got to have something to give. But it was the only seed we had to plant, so we planted it. Now, I know the biggest need faced the ministry at that time was another facility. We were packing in 100 kids to a little room set about 50 people, I think, on Fridays and Saturday night, just kind of shove them in there and having Bible studies and evangelism and concerts and, and ministry take place there in that little building. But it was I, I probably was about, I mean, the few days went by after that. Then we got a knock on the door at the house, and Phil goes and answered it, and there's this uh, preacher from the neighborhood from a Quaker church, a friend's church. And he is sitting there with tears in his eyes. He's saying, God hasn't let me sleep. I just can't get, over, get, get around this. I've been watching you guys and the ministry going on here. And God just spoke to my heart. We have a second building that we used to use and no longer use. And it needs a lot of work, by the way. He said, but we just want to give it to you guys and give it to the ministry. Now, folks, the value of that, just looking at it, knowing that, hey, a lot of work had to go in it, still even with a lot of work, it was a very valuable gift just to give away to a bunch of long-haired preacher boys in ministry. But there was no reason on the earth why anybody would want to do that, why he'd want, other than just God. We didn't even know the guy. Never met the man. And he gave us a building and property to go along with it. And a seed was planted that, you know, it might have been shoes, but it came up from the ground a building. <laughs> That was one of the most exciting, transformative moments of my life, and I'm sure it feels as well, in that moment to see what God can do. A miracle was in the making. 
A miracle was about to happen. All too often we say, well, I just don't know how I'm going to get by. I don't think I'm going to have my needs are going to be. I just, I've got a limited income. Well, maybe you're the one who's limiting it. Amen. Amen. Maybe you're the one who's holding everything back because you set back and you've missed the mark of what it really means to be a joyful giver. Let me just give you a few points here real quickly what it means to be a, a joyful giver. One, hilarious, joyful, cheerful giving is God-honoring worship. If you look at that passage in, in verses 10 and 11, Listen again. Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And by the way, David likes to bless the Lord a lot when you read the Bible. He's not quiet about it, and he's very open about it. You know, he doesn't care if anybody sees him raise his hands. He doesn't care if anybody hears him sing. He doesn't care if anybody watches him dance around. He's praising the Lord. Before everybody, he blesses the Lord and said, Blessed be thou, Lord, God of Israel, Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and all that's in the earth, it is yours. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted above all. He realizes that all this giving that he has put together to give to the Lord is an act, first and foremost, of worship. We've got to get back to that in our giving. You know, Paul told the church, as, as, he said, as the Lord prospers you, each week you should be setting aside. Now, I know some of you don't get paid each week. You get paid on the 1st and the 15th or whatever it is, or quarterly, or whatever your job may do. I get paid on you know, 1st and 15th. But I, I give, you know, it may be a little quirky. I'm that kind of guy. I, I, we, Kathy and I decide we're going to give every week, all right, as the Lord has prospered because we just like following the Bible kind of literally, all right? So we do that as an action and as a practice, but we do it with an enjoyment and with an excitement and with a, with a, with a, a desire and a passion to know that God's going to be glorified by what we're doing. And we realize that as we do it, this is worship. God's called me to worship Him. In what better way can I recognize that God really truly is the source of my life than to honor Him with some of what He's given me? What better way? I give him my time, I give him my talents, I give him my treasures. Because why? Only time I got is what he's given me. <laughs> only talent I've got is what he's given me. The only treasures he's, I have is what he's given me. So who should I honor with that? If you think that you're the author and the source of the blessings that are in your life, you are certainly blind and far, far away from the truth. But here he is. We give because we realize God owns it all anyway. And the miracle is, just like the children of Israel, you know, God gave me the offering before they, he required the offering. And just like David saying here, he said, man, everything is, is, is from you, the Lord. It's all you. So it starts with worship. But then the second aspect of this, God, hilarious, cheerful giving is full of gratitude. If you, if you read that verses 12 and 13, what's he say? Riches and honor come from thee. You rule over all, and in your hand is power and might, and it lies in your hand to make great. It lies in your hand to strengthen everyone. Therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. What's he saying? We're thankful, Lord. We wouldn't have anything if it was not for you. I want you just to stop there, put the brakes on, pull the handle back for a second, put your foot on the brake, and say, hey, I wouldn't have a thing if it wasn't for God. Can you just say that to yourself real quick? Maybe just say it out loud. I wouldn't have a thing if it wasn't for God. Let's say it one more time. I wouldn't have a thing if it weren't for God. Isn't that the truth, though? That is the absolute truth. I draw my next breath of air because of God. My heart beats one more time because of God. My liver is functioning, my kidneys function, my heart is working, my lungs are working, my brain mostly, all right, because of God. I wouldn't have a thing. If you think that, again, if you're the total, the sum total of all that you have is from your hand, then you certainly miss the mark. This mark especially. True, hilarious, cheerful giving is just marked and full of humility. I love this passage. Who am I? And who are these people that we should be able to offer as generously as this? For all things come from you, and from your hand we've given you. We are sojourners before thee, and just tenants, as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no hope. Catch this. Here's this great offering we're giving to God. You know what most people do in that moment? <clears throat> Make sure the pastor sees how much I gave. <laughs> right? Make sure the church... You know, is there, is there a brick I can put my name on somewhere that say I gave so much? Is, is there like a memorial wall that I can fasten my name upon? 
No, there, we wouldn't, this all came from God. I'm not such, a, not such a big deal. It comes from God. And who are we? I love you. We're just tenants. How many of you think you own your home? You don't own your home. Yes. If you own your home, when you die, pack it up and take it with you. It's not going to happen. God owns your home. Everything goes back to him. Everything comes from him. It's all going to him. Amen. You, you're just a tenant. Now you may take some measures and write yourself a will and say the kid gets this and that kid gets this and this grandkid gets this. And, you know, the Lord gets this. I think one of the most honorable things you can do with your will is leave something into the kingdom. At least the one last tithe before you die, amen? One last gift to the kingdom before you check out. That's a God-honoring way to leave, amen? Remember whose presence you're getting ready to step in, by the way. Might help with that, all right? But hey, who are we? We're just passing through. Now this belongs to me. I'm just using it. I'm just using it. That is such humility that needs to be recognized, but that's where joy begins to come. I give because everything I have been given, it all comes from him. I can give it back to him. The fourth thing here I want you to catch is this joyful, cheerful giving. It is full of expectation. Both in Exodus and also in First Chronicles here, there was this goal in mind. There was a temple, there was a tabernacle, there was ministry, there was worship, there was a place to meet, all right? There was a place of service. There was a place for the priestly ministry to be carried out. There was an object. We as well, we give that way, not just for buildings and land, and for, but it's all about people. It's all about ministry. Everything God was doing with the tent, with the temple, was, was not about the buildings, because ultimately God said, I'm going to build people. You're going to be the living tabernacles. You're going to be the lively stones. So everything we're ultimately giving to is to go into people and to see people's lives changed and to see God be glorified and people's eternity and their eternal state forever transferred to the kingdom and to heaven and to the glory and the presence of God. That's what you're giving about each week's really all about. That's what your offerings are really all about. And you should be excited about that. You should be enthused about that, that I get to be a part of what God's doing. Remember I said the children of Israel coming out, they began to get the vision. They began to get the story. They began to understand we really are the children of Abraham. God is really getting ready to do something grand. God is really getting ready to do something phenomenal. And so they're getting the big picture of what's going on. Are you? Do you see the big picture? That this is about lives and about hearts and about homes being forever touched and changed. We're excited about giving. We're joyful about giving. Why? Because we see what God's, where God's headed with this Amen. and what the results are going to be. Somebody's heart's going to be forever changed. Now, you know, I, I give my offerings on Sunday. Uh, when we get paid, I, you know what I do with my check? I don't even touch that. Kathy does it. I have to be honest, all right? <laughs> she takes it and she deposits it. She goes down to the bank, puts it in that little clear tube, sends it inside, and they send a little receipt back says, thank you very much for your business. All right? And it goes into the bank. Now, the Bible tells us to lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust are not corrupt. So weekly, we put something in that little tube here at church called the offering receptacle. And we realize that that's not where it's really going. That it is going to heaven. So where do we... How, how am I going to get it to heaven? Well, the only thing going to heaven is people. I know some of your dogs and cat stories, but we'll worry about that. That's another sermon. <laughs> people. Amen. Jesus died to save people. God loves people. God loves the world that he gave his only begotten. We love people. So we give because we want to see people's lives changed. We want to see their hearts forever changed for the glory of God. And so we make the commitment. But we do so with an expectation that lives are really going to be changed, that we're part of something bigger. But one of the most important things in verse 17, he talks about how these people did this with a willing heart. You know, there was this, there was this, this desire to honor God, you know, that they came with, with, the, 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 with their whole heart. And he makes an important point, and this is something that doesn't need to be missed because he's talking to these people and he's encouraging them what he's done. But he lets them know ultimately, this is all before the Lord. And it's God who sees what's going on. You know, it's God who sees what we give. It's God who sees what we keep. He's the one who tries our heart. He's the one who's involved in our life. And he's looking for, what's he say there? The uprightness of heart. He says, I have willingly offered from my heart these things. And I've seen the joy of the people. 
that are present here. We come and we make our gifts, not because the preacher's telling sad stories or twisting our arms or making us feel like a dirty scumbag if we didn't give something today, you know, or laboring over the offerings. No, listen, folks, we don't even pass plates here. We have receptacles. That's, that was the way they did it in the Bible, all right? In the Bible, there was what they called the treasury of the Lord. There were, there were, these, there were these, these, these boxes out there, the treasury boxes, and people would come and they placed their gifts. That's when the little widow came in, and remember she cast in out of her need? I mean, she, she wasn't bound by her limit, limited situation. She stepped outside the bounds of her limits, and she gave abundantly. It was just a little bit, but it was more in the big picture of things than everybody else had given. And the Lord was standing, it says, over and against the treasury. That was that location. And she came by and she put her gift in. So it's helpful to us to remember, the Lord does stand near the offering box in the church. <laughs> but as she's there, the Lord comments at this woman about her great faith. And as she'd done more and honored God in such a big way. Her little bitty bit was as much as David's massive bit here because it glorified God. And it was done with such a heart of worship and a heart of praise and to honor God in that particular way. That's giving. That's joyful giving. Amen. Now, what hinders us from doing that? You know, in 1 Chronicles 29, it says, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the intent of the thoughts of the heart and of your people and fix their heart towards you. Now, let me tell you, that fixes, doesn't always translate to us into English. We think about fix something. It's, well, I got a leaky faucet. I'll fix it. Hey, I had a bad heart full of sin. God fixed it, all right? He, he washed me clean. But this word doesn't mean that. It has to do with make steady, to be true, to stand strong, to be unmovable, to be abounding in the work of the Lord, to have your heart fixed. So this issue of my giving, at least this weekly giving aspect, because we give over and above to other things as well, but this weekly giving thing, our heart's fixed in that. That's not, that's not up for debate. Well, you know, the air conditioner, I don't care. My t that part of my giving, that part of my, my livelihood, that's not, that's not to be used for anything but for the kingdom work. I don't use it if I have a, need a set of tires. All right? In fact, I probably won't get any tires if I do use it. Or there'll be bad tires. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. We have a fixed heart and a committed heart. Let me give four quick reasons why people don't give this way. And if one of them applies to you, then just take it for what it is. One is, I think we're just ignorant. Praise God that somebody set us down and gave us these principles early on. Amen. Now, we discovered them in time as walking with God and studying the Word. We discovered them. But praise God, somebody was faithful enough to help us in a very young place in our Christian walk in life to lay these principles out very clearly and teach them to us and how we could be obedient and God's blessings would come as a part of the obedience all right some people just not they're just I'm not saying they're ignorant is a negative they're just ignorant because they don't know now I don't think you can be around our church very long and not learn biblical principles that, that apply to this pretty quickly Amen. but they're just ignorant I'm not saying you're stupid not, you know that's that's another category <laughs> ignorant another reason why people don't give it is, is carnality that's a good bible word from the King James language and it's translated in the New American Standard as, as fleshy and fleshly. It's two words. Because in the, in the original Greek language, when Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, he says, he said, I wanted to come to you as, as, as men, as deep men of spiritual God, but you're not. He said, you're carnal. When I first came to you, you were carnal. And he says, now you are yet carnal. It would say in our modern translation, you were, you were fleshy, and now you're still fleshly. What's that mean? It means you were babes in Christ, so it's understandable that you don't know. But you've been taught, but you're not responding. And so you're, you're fleshly. You're not, you're not spiritual people. He said you can't see and you don't understand the deeper things of God and the deeper truths of God because you're not moving forward in obedience to what the Lord's been teaching you. And therefore, there's this fleshiness. And what happens with carnal people, if you read 1 Corinthians 3, they just don't get it. They're too preoccupied with the world, their old life, the way they used to be, or preoccupied with things, and they miss it brings us to the third reason some people don't get it is really greed and this is certainly a powerful force in the world we're living in because we're consumed with consumerism right we just think we, we're, we're constantly being told you need this we're constantly being, being bombarded with 
TV ads and radio and media and billboards and pop-ups on our internet that tell us, you need this, you've got to have this, you need this, you need to look like this, and so if you want to look like this, send us this amount of money so you can look like this and so you can be respected. If you want to be respected, then you need to have this. If you really want people to like you, then you need this. You're just not happy unless you have this. And the bottom line, the favorite, the way they set the hook is like this, and it kind of comes in right under your jaw. You deserve this. You deserve this. Well, I certainly do. I think I'll give money I don't have for something I don't need. And that's called credit. And we're easily consumed, the desire to have more. The Bible talks about having contentment with godliness, this great gain. When's the point of contentment? When is, are, you, are you there yet? If you're not there, you're probably not ever going to get there. Contentment with godliness is a great gain. It hinders so many people from enjoying the real blessings of God on their life. And the fourth and last reason is warfare. Satan does not want you to discover this joy any more than he wants you to discover the joy of soul winning, the joy of witnessing, the joy of spending time with God, the joy of fellowship in a quiet time with God. Satan won't, he doesn't want you to have that time with God. He doesn't want you to have a time of study. He doesn't want you to know the Word of God. He doesn't want you to do the things of God. He doesn't want you to participate in the kingdom of God or in the works of God. And he uses things like doubt and torment and fear to kind of keep your mind right. Well, you just can't afford it, or it's not for you. Let somebody else do it. Maybe later. You need, you, know, you need to kind of go through a healing process you're in right now. And then maybe later you can give. Or when you make a little more money than what you're making now, then you or I can just give a little bit. And you just ignore the biblical principles of the blessings of God on your life and giving proportionally. Amen. Some of you have been given the same amount for years. And although your income has grown, you're still stuck in a rut. And you're missing the joy and the excitement of real giving. I'll close with this statement here. Everything we keep for ourselves now, we'll eventually lose. That's a true statement, wouldn't you agree? But let me give you another one. Everything we give to the kingdom now, we'll always keep. You're laying up for yourself treasures in heaven. Moth's not going to get to it. Inflation's not going to get to it. Recession's not going to get to it. Depression's not going to get to it. You're investing in lives through the kingdom of God. And you're realizing the joy that is in seeing people's lives changed. To me, folks, the most profound thing of being part of what God's doing is just seeing the results of the gospel and the power of God manifest through the gospel, it says in Romans 1, that it literally transforms people's hearts and lives. You're most likely here, sitting here, I would say for the majority of you, is a child of God, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're here because somebody cared. You're here because somebody gave. Somebody prayed. Somebody made a commitment. Who's here because of what you're doing? We need to keep it moving, folks. And we need to be excited about it, joy-filled, not like it's a horrible, sad thing. You know, I, I, I can't imagine how, how we got so far away from the simplicity of the truth of, of God's Word, just being obedient children of God in the kingdom, just learning how to, real, that real living comes from real giving, and real dying comes from withholding. When's the last time you gave a real gift and honor the Lord with it? When's the last time? I mean, if, if we were to take your finances, kind of set it down in kind of an audit format, here's how much you've, you took in this year, and here's what you've been giving so far this year. Is there any proportionality of blessings? Is there any, anywhere where you've been growing? You know, I, I've always admired people like J.C. Penney and R.G. Letourneau, those guys who, who desired more than anything else was to, our, our goal is to keep 10% and give 90%. That's a great goal in life, is it not? Nobody remembers anybody that keeps. People remember for what they give and what they gave. Be that individual. Be that child of God that God says, hey, that's somebody I can put my trust in. And I can put my money in their hands. 
I can put my money in their hand, and they'll be faithful with it. Instead, we, always, we get a blessing in our life, even over and above what we've been making. Some blessing comes through, some gift of some sort comes in, some, some boatload happens for us, and we're all excited about it, and we're trying to figure out where we can spend it right away. And say, so how does God want me to use this for his kingdom? Amen? Let's stand with our heads bowed. Father, we come to you this morning, we thank you. Because all we have has come from your hand. You have given us more than we certainly deserve and more than we have imagined. God, forgive us when we get so self-centered thinking we need more, we deserve more. Help us to walk humbly in your presence. God, to be a people of love like you are be a person of gratitude and humility that understands there is a joy in being a part of that miracle that you're working out in our lives. I pray today, God, that our hearts would be so tender and so sensitive to the things you're saying and doing. We'd have a willingness to move to the place of disciplines in our life. Be excited about who you are and what you're doing. With our heads bowed just for a moment, let me take you back to the cross for a moment. You can have life because Jesus gave his life. Scripture tells us that God gave his only son. But the result of that has been he has many, he's brought in many sons because of the gift of his son. And we've been brought into the kingdom because God gave. We should be giving, bringing others into the kingdom. I pray if this issue has been something that the Lord spoke to your heart about today, that you would just lay it over in his hands. We're going to give an invitation today. If you've never given your life to Christ, I certainly want to invite you to come to any one of the men that's here in the altar today and say, listen, I want to surrender my heart and my life to Jesus Christ. And let us pray with you and rejoice with you in the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life, the decision to follow Jesus. As a Christian, maybe there's a need here in your life and you want somebody to pray with you. Any of us would be glad to pray with you. Maybe you just want to come to the altar and find a place between you and your Heavenly Father, between your high priest, the Lord Jesus. Spend some time with it. Maybe there's something the Lord's dealing with you about. Maybe it's about this. Maybe it's about something else. But please feel free this morning to, stay, to take a step of faith, an action on your part to respond to what the Holy Spirit said to you today. Be faithful and obedient to Him. If you're looking for a church home, you believe that's where the Lord's leading you, You've been praying about this, and you come to either one of us as well and say, listen, I want to be a part of what God's doing here at Believer's Fellowship. But whatever the Lord's saying to you today, if we worship the Lord, as we sing this song of worship, please feel free to step out and do as the Lord has led you to do today. A decision needs to be made. It won't be made until you step out, make a willful decision. You come today. Let's be honest and let's be hopeful to the Lord.